very much for asking me uh, uh, to this session. Um, I'm an archaeological teacher, so any research I do is either as a hobby or as a consultant, so a slightly different variety of academic. Uh, this paper, in many ways, is a work in progress. Uh, I'm interested in how we theorize natural places, uh, and in particular wild places, and also the way in which people use wild spaces, both in the present day and in the past. Uh, in, this in this presentation, I wish to discuss how we think about the wild and examine a range of different approaches to the wild, wildness, uh, and wilderness derived from a variety of different writers uh, and approaches. This paper was simulated by and originates in several projects that have been involved in recently, uh, all looking at contemporary archaeology. Uh, a few years ago, I spent a year uh, volunteering on nature reserves for the Worcester Wildlife Trust. Uh, and during this time, I was struck by what we call wild places come into being, how people use wild places, uh, and how we mutable our designation of a wild place is. Uh, and this led to a small project uh, looking at the archaeology graffiti in wild places. And this is some of that. Around the same time, uh, I was looking at another project, looking at landscape archaeology of some ancient yews uh, and ancient trees uh, in the Lake District uh, in Borrowdale. And this led me to wonder, if we truly are entering the Anthropocene, what is the archaeology of the wild? Oh, that's my place. Uh, what exactly is the wild? Where were the last plate wild places in England? Is the wild simply a form of what Simmons would call a cultural construction? Now, I'm not going to answer those questions in 15 minutes, but these are some thoughts I have borrowed uh, to help me towards an interpretation. In thinking about nature and nature reserves, I want to briefly explain some of the history of the thought behind the idea of the wild, especially the ideas of Wordsworth, Thoreau, uh, and a recent environmental philosopher called Woods. While we spend a lot of time thinking about nature, it is often within the context of this nature-culture dichotomy. And I just want to break that out a little bit uh, and think specifically about waste, wild, and what are now uh, interstitial areas where management is not practiced. In thinking about the wild, though, I was confronted by a problem. The wild is not much discussed in archaeology. There is Leslie McInnes' 1994 book on archaeology in the Green Debate, Richard Bradley's book on the archaeology of nature, and the various publications of Tim Ingalls. But none of these seem to really address the issues I'm interested in. Archaeologists' areas of interest are mainly concerned with the cultural landscapes of the farm and field, and little thought has been given to the trackless wastes that lie outside the head dikes and garths of our settlement. The wild in popular culture was often identified with primitive emotions like horror and terror. The OED defines wild as an adjective, being an animal or plant living in a state of nature not tamed, domesticated, or cultivated, or as a noun. Wild is first recorded uh, in the 8th century AD. Wilderness is a noun meaning a wild or uncultivated tract of land, uninhabited by humans, or inhabited only by wild animals. Wildness can refer to either people or animals as being undomesticated or untamed. This idea of wild and wilderness as something that was both unproductive and something to be tamed and domesticated dominated much thinking and in some circles still does. One of the difficulties we have in understanding what a state of nature means is that it is not fixed. For most Europeans in the past and for some in the present, all of creation was due to God, or gods. One of the difficulties we have when interpreting past authors is that we do not generally believe uh, in divine creation today. And so what a state of nature means has shifted somewhat to mean unaffected by human activity. This idea of an animal or plant or habitat being in a state of nature is a very Eurocentric perspective uh, and has become known, particularly in the US, as the received idea of wilderness in the wild. I now just want to quickly review some of the ideas uh, about the wild and the changes that took place from the middle of the 18th century in England. At this time, the idea of wildness as a waste that needed to be conquered and brought into cultivation began to be challenged. Uh, 
The Romantic poets, especially Coleridge, himself influenced by Kant, and later Wordsworth and Ruskin, put forward a new series of ways of looking at the wild, both as a place for aesthetic appreciation, recreation, and spiritual improvement, all central to the developing picturesque movement of the late 18th and 19th century. However, it is worth remembering that poets like Wordsworth still held a distinction between the cultivated nature of the farm and the field and the inalienable other of the wild. Wordsworth, in his memoir, The Prelude, captures this feeling very well. As a child, one night he stole a boat and rowed out into the lake, and he managed to give himself a memorable fright as the mountainside seemed to rise up, the grim shape towered above me, and the stars, and still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own, strode after me. At this vision of the mountain he rowed for the shore with trembling oars, and through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. O'er my thought there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, move slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. I would argue that in this section, Wordsworth is reflecting on his own familiar experience of nature as the farm or house and its home fields, and this new experience of something outside himself that ran on different principles, and that was fundamentally alien to his understanding. This is his insight into that part of the world which is largely unmanageable and therefore wild. My next author, though, wasn't terribly uh, worried about this. He instead went off to find it and this was Henry David Thoreau. Uh, Thoreau was an American philosopher. Many of you may have read him, I don't know. Uh, on July the 4th, 1845, he went to Walden Pond near Concord in Massachusetts to experiment in simple living. He had been given land to squat on by his mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, and he published his account of his experiences there as Walden in 1854. He died eight years later at the age of 44. Together with his other writings, Thoreau was to uh, prefigure and dominate much of the thinking in ecology and ecological and environmental philosophy. In particular, he developed the idea of the importance of wildness and wilderness for human survival and health, the idea that areas should be set aside for nature, and that nature is and was an inalienable other, incapable of true understanding. Reading and looking to Walden for guidance in my projects, I found that Thoreau prefigures much of contemporary archaeology. He argues that we should inhabit the landscape, spend time in it, try and study it not as an alienated observer, but by being fully engaged with it. He asks us to ignore the pyramids and the boobies who built them, but to pay attention to the people who are not doing great things, but are living a simpler life. And he himself made a study of the Penobscot and Massachusetts people who had lived near Concord. So in my projects, I have attempted to spend as much time in the landscape, uh, to give as much thought to the ecological as to the human dimension, and in particular to think about how the wild and the cultivated, the managed and the unmanaged interact. Thoreau was keen to make the point that the otherness of the wild did not just reside in the mountains and the spectacular, but instead was all around us, unnoticed and unheeded, but always there, always waiting. His genius was to find the wild a few miles out of town, just across the railroad tracks. Uh, a point recently made by Jurgensen and Talco in their review of urban wild spaces. The wild in Thoreau's thought was pretty much everywhere a plant or an animal grew without the hand of man. And a wilderness was an extensive area in which humans had little or no influence. In this though, Thoreau departs from a lot of modern thinking about nature and that he always took care to include humans in his descriptions of the wild and the wilderness, recognising that in what he was looking at was often the process of, human, of an interaction between human agriculture and industry and the natural processes of succession. And he was one of the first to recognise uh, the concept of succession. How are these ideas about the wild now viewed? Is the received idea of wilderness and the wild still valid? Can we argue that wildness exists in the UK? Or was it cultivated away a long time ago? Uh, 
Uh, and in this section, I want to largely look at the context of wildness within the context of environmental protection. But the points raised, I think, are useful for archaeologists. And this mostly depends on an article by Woods. Uh, he discusses uh, our understanding of the received wilderness idea uh, with regard to the setting of some new wildernesses in the badlands of North Dakota. Using the standard definition of wilderness from the American Wilderness Act of 1964, the key concept is a place largely untrammeled by man and that can be managed to preserve its condition, can be used for recreation, and may have ecological, geological, or other cultural value. This idea of wilderness forms the basis of the dominant model of nature conservation across much of the globe. But it defines wildness and wilderness as a cultural construction that can only be maintained by human interference. Uh, this idea has several counter-arguments. The first is the ecological argument. When SSSI's nature reserves and wilderness reserves were being set up in the early 20th century, there was little understanding of the role of disturbance ecology, perturbation, succession, and more importantly, farming in the management of nature reserves. In the overwhelming view was that nature reserves were in equilibrium and therefore should remain as they are with only a light touch management regime. This sadly led to the demise of quite a few triple SIs as the abandoning of traditional techniques of agriculture and management led to regeneration and changes to the original plant assemblages. And this is just some regeneration since the Second World War. Um, so we need to be aware that change does and will occur in wilderness areas. In many cases though, the ecological argument asks us to look again at what a truly ecocentric as opposed to anthropocentric management ethic might be. Then there's the conceptual argument <clears throat> that because humans are in the world, the simple act of a human being seeing a place brings it within the cultural sphere and that nature cannot exist apart from humans, an approach taken by many archaeologists. Uh, I'm not really going to go into this too much, uh, but I just would like to say about the nature-culture dichotomy that Woods, following Soper, makes the case that a metaphysical distinction between cultural and natural is helpful in framing the argument. It is also helpful to recognise that there are processes and actions that long predate the arrival of humans in the landscape and which therefore have only transitory human or cultural influence. Woods uses the example of a bentonite slope he once walked over. The creation and form of that slope has nothing to do with people, and he would argue that the mere act of conceptualising the slope does not turn it into a cultural artefact. It, the Bentonite slope, and the world have in this view of wilderness existed separated, existences separate to, but parallel to humans. The received view of wilderness largely fails in many parts of the world, and possibly America, because humans have, by and large, lived in the world for a long period of time now, and almost everywhere is felt to have been within a human sphere of influence at some point or other, particularly in Europe. This has given rise to what we might call the no-wilderness argument within archaeological and heritage circles, that nature is far from natural. Virtually every acre of the British Isles has been extensively shaped by human activity. And this uh, idea has been repeated so often that it has become a truism largely unquestioned, and implicit within it, I would argue, is the sense that therefore in contemporary thought that we can pretty much do what we want with nature. Uh, this approach is particularly prevalent in the management of nature reserves and archaeological sites, where it is seen that as vital that nature is developed and management to achieve set aims. I would argue that this is neither sustainable or consistent with an ecocentric as opposed to an anthropocentric perspective on nature conservation or the display of archaeological sites for that matter. I would argue that there are serious problems with what we might call the purity argument, which underpins the no wilderness approach. This assertion that for somewhere to remain natural, humans cannot have affected it ever, is to me unhelpful. It seems to harken back to ideas of nature as a personification of virtue and a set of sexual ideas that nature must remain chaste and unsullied uh, <coughs> much like a virgin, in order to be truly natural. I would argue instead that a wilderness condition can re-emerge from landscapes that have been impacted, and that we see that constantly occurring. 
whether it is in poorly managed nature reserves, abandoned factories, or around the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. This has been a quick overview of a very complex topic. Environments are dynamic. Successional processes are ongoing. Abandonment or reduced management would see rapid scrub development, failure to maintain heathland, would see it become species poor grassland or scrub. There is often a conceit that in the past the landscape was extensively controlled and managed in much the same way as today. I would argue instead that we need to build in the wild as an active participant in our models of the past. People in the past would have had to traverse wildernesses. They would have encountered the wild in all of its many faces, droughts, cold spells, storms and predators. We have at present few ways of building this into our models of settlement distribution and density. I would argue using the approach of Thoreau and those of contemporary thought in environmental philosophy that the wild exists as something separate but interconnected with human culture. Instead of thinking about the past as a series of cultural constructions, I think we would be better returning to Thoreau's idea of the interactions between culturally dominated ecosystems and what would in the past have been thought of wild nature as a dynamic one, in which wild animals and wild plants are always trying to adapt to the changing conditions to fulfill what they are programmed to do, and which humans are using a variety of tools, either in farming or hunter-gathering, to create conditions more suitable for their own survival which I would call environmental management. Thanks. <laughs>